We call this collaborative governance. It's a term that they have used to come across in the background. Now, you've heard all of the, how to say, speeches, the talking over the years about transparency in government. And the reality to it is, this is so transparent, very few people get to see it, understand it, or understand what they've done to take away our traditional form of representative government. Now, as we look at that, and we follow through, and we go into what we're trying to cover here tonight, I'm going to take you to a very simple explanation of where it was taken away. And again, we go through here, shows you the legislative, the executive, and now we get to the judicial, okay? Now the judicial branch is where they have taken hold and taken away our representative form of government. The Oregon Constitution gives us a guideline. All Constitution gives us, all, they give us a guideline of how our system was set up and is supposed to work. This is an administrative intrusion into that, okay? And what they've done is basically taken laws that they, they call them laws, but they're, they do it through executive order, and you have to understand a certain timeline to go through everything that we're going to talk about here tonight. When I go back to, let me go back to this. This is an example of where it started. This executive order tied in all of the regional solutions to the Oregon solutions, to the Oregon consensus, and if you look at it in a tiered type platform, Oregon enacted in 1989 the Dispute Resolution Commission. Now the Dispute Resolution Commission was a mediation section of our legal or court system. As that, how to say, evolved, they ended up abolishing this in 2003 and at that point made the Oregon University system a state agency. Now that agency became the model for collaborative governance intrusion because it was literally an intrusion that they factored in and wanted to pursue. And when you understand that aspect of it, and the documentation exists, and this is what I say, when you look at something and you call it or you call out for transparency in government, the idea is to get the transparency, you have to understand where to look. I find all of this because I started looking, and I started looking very hard, and I started finding documents that just made me sick, okay? So as we go through this, all of this is true, what you see written here, okay? Every law passed in Oregon is subject to this new system, and this is what they've done to us. Everything has come through a system of trying to do this. But this is the key factor that you have to take away from tonight. Government-sponsored consensus processes are not the traditional forms in which policies are made, administer, uh, administered, or adjudicated in a democracy. And this is from the Practical Guide to Consensus, the abbreviated version found on their websites. Now, the websites that I'm speaking of are the National Policy Consensus Center, the Policy Consensus Initiative, this practical guide to consensus is part of the program that they actively recruit people into at the university level. Now, under this program, you have a di divisions that are set up. The Oregon Solutions Program is set up with that particular part of it. And underneath the Oregon Solutions is the Oregon Consensus, the Oregon Solutions Network. All of these are the places that they take it to to, to pursue a change in our government situation. Now, when you look at this, the traditional forms and mechanisms for determining who participates directly in the writing and administration of law are spelled out in constitutions, charters, statutes, and rules. This is in connection to this other statement you just heard me read. This is totally out of the rules. It's totally an intrusion. And it's important to understand because we're going to take you to where that intrusion came from. And I've, we've highlighted these so you can see they're spelled out in the Constitution. Okay? This stuff is totally, totally illegal if you really get down to it. Question is, what is collaborative governance? Now here's a quote from the Oregon Consensus people. Collaborative governance is a method of public decision making in which is 
and I want you to pay particular attention to what we highlighted here, method of public decision making in which government leaders involve stakeholders from many areas of society, including community members, businesses, other government agencies, and nonprofit organizations in making decisions that affect how people are governed or how public resources are used. Now we go to other government agencies, and I want you to focus on that term for just a second. Now remember what I said a few moments ago. The Oregon University system was made a state agency. It is the only university in the country that was given that designation. When it was given that designation, what happened was it was given the ability to cooperate in any way, shape, or form with any and all agencies or governmental organizations in the country. And in the, when you look at the extent of what they do, and I, one day I followed the money, how it all transferred and everything, but you look at what they're involved in with these groups. And in every state, they're trying to push this. So this is literally, as, as we were promised a fundamental change in America eight years ago, this is the manifestation of it. All of this has occurred and it's pushed in ways that you can't believe. Our original design of a representative republic shows everything is empowered to us as citizens. They have totally removed that aspect of it and substituted it. And again, through the judiciary part of it. We look here and when we set this up originally, I had Dennis actually add a second red line, if you notice, from the collaborative government stakeholder consensus back to the representative judiciary. Now, a lot of our judges are uh, elected, some are appointed, but it's imperative that we start getting involved with the judges, okay? Because the judges are what has occurred in every level of how this is enforced. And here's an idea of what happened in Klamath Falls. Now, this comes from Dennis's experiences. When you look at that, everything in red, these are all stakeholder groups, okay? These are all the people that were involved given power over a decision of a local governing body. All of these people were brought in and brought in to have a, a total input and a power over the residents, you know, the people that reside there, over everyone that was involved in that area, over the commission, over everybody. And in the end result, it became a nightmare, and it still is. What you're seeing is the lead page. This is from the American Bar Association. Okay, now the American Bar Association is the lead bar association in the country. Okay, it's comprised of about 400,000 members, as they call it out, and 3,500 entities. Now, of that, there's 28 organizations that are crucial to what I'm talking about here tonight. But when you look at this and you see what I've highlighted and you go back to the timeline that I was talking about earlier, you can start seeing the formation of everything that we're dealing with. We come into this, the American Bar Association reaffirms its 1991 and 2003 commitments. Now this is, if you look at the date, August 12 and 13 of 2013 but they can reaffirms their commitments to the 2003 and the 1991 to sustainable development. And they define sustainable development as a promotion of an economically, socially, and environmentally sustainable, environmentally sustainable future for our planet and for present and future generations. Further resolved, the American Bar Association urges all governments, lawyers, and ABA entities to act in ways that accelerate progress towards sustainability. Now, you think, think to yourself for a moment, well, what's he talking about? Who's the American Bar Association? What kind of effect can this have? Well, you're looking at lists of organizations. Now, if you'll notice on the right-hand side, about halfway down, what do you see? The Conference of Chief Justices, okay? So what does that take us? That takes us to our Supreme Courts in every part of the country, all the state Supreme Courts, the federal Supreme Court, all of these people. You have to ask yourself how many of these people participate actively in this group, okay? Now this group has resolved as an organization to move us towards sustainable development under the UN protocols of sustainable development. Mm -hmm. Sustainable development is a term and they have actively moved to pursue that in every way and encourage 
everyone to go after it in that part of it, that they're, it's involved in their organization. Now, when you look at this, you look at this, here's the Judge Advocates Association, the association of, it goes to life insurance, maritime law of the United Nation, of the United States, everything that you can imagine, the Federal Circuit Bar Association, this is every decision that we have had made in our lives. And when you think about the Supreme Court decision, think about if it was just a couple weeks ago, the, the aspect of the gay marriage uh, was legalized by our Supreme Court justices. Well, this is going according to the United Nations movement towards sustainable societies. All of this has an impact, and these are, when we can't figure out, well, why did that happen? Why did that decision occur? 99.99%, it's because of an affiliation to this group, being that this is their agenda. In the long run, they anticipate a profiteering type move from this. This is the only logical outcome to it all. There is a move towards this. I talked about once before, there, a, a very good example of this is, a year and a half ago, I believe, there was a uh, environmentalist, a radical that was, she turned herself in. She had been on the run for seven years and hiding in Canada. She was part of Earth Justice. They had uh, destroyed, if I remember the figure, it was almost $40 million worth of the property that belongs to the United States, okay, of our taxpayer dollars through BLM um, areas. They had burnt and blown up and destroyed almost that much in it. Now, in the end result, she turned herself in, and a, the federal judge that sentenced her sentenced her to the lightest possible sentence that she could, and as part of her sentence, she was told to read two books, and the one book was called Nature's Trust by Mary Wood out of the university system, and Mary Wood is the author of Nature's Trust, and what she defines in this book is an idea of taking the public trust doctrine, which has been a part of our background law since day one of our country, basically. But it concerned uh, areas of the public domain that they want to take over, so they're trying to increase every part of that. And they do it through this collaborative governance. They're sneaking in with everything in ways that they they, they'll attack it and bring it to you and all of a sudden it's a newspaper article for you to read because they're ignoring, they try to get around the public comment areas of our laws and our legal system. Now we go up here and this is another example that you can all ponder very easily. Upper left hand corner, what does that say? The National Asian Pacific Bar Association, okay? Now what, do you, what does that have relevance to? Have you heard in the past few weeks the TPP that everybody's so upset about? Now, why did it get passed? Well, it's a global governance type move. Well, this particular thing is part of that also. All of this is basically in a collusion of what's going on. Every part of this has a tie-in back, and we sit back without knowing the direction. We don't have any way to fight it, and that's the hardest part. This highlights the plan of implementation on the, of the World Su Summit on Sustainable Development. And this is basically the Agenda 21. Every time you read these documents, it resorts back to Agenda 21, Agenda 21. And for years they said Agenda 21 didn't exist. Well, it's all over the documents that they, that they put out, okay? So basically what you have is a completely hijacked judiciary system that is functioning at the highest levels that is allowing this to occur. This is an example going back again on a timeline. I'm going to go back to 1998. This is from a paper called The Politics of Impl Implementation. Okay, And these are words that we have to look at. These are words and ideas that we have to start thinking about. When you look for things or if you ever do any research on this stuff, implementation is a key word. You have to look for their long-term strategies. You have to look for their plans of implementation because they spell out, they're very organized with this, and they spell out where they want to go. But this particular document, it struck me that the nightmare began here because this is a perfect example. This document, this paper, has to do with Oregon statewide transportation planning rule and what's been accomplished and how. So now this is defining this back in 1998. Now this is before the 2003, but it was already moving ahead. It was already an implemented plan. 
they needed to fine tune it. They needed to move to certain areas to really start moving ahead with it. And these were the points at which it moved ahead. But these are the founding principles. Now, when you read this, I don't know if any, everybody can read it back there. But it says, Paul and Winkler developed the corporatist theory with respect to Britain in the 1970s. Okay, now take that as a statement and sit back for a second and say, well, what are we talking about? Why are we, why are we following a British plan from the 1970s? Isn't this America? Isn't this, isn't this the land of the free and the home of the brave and everything else that we grew up with and that we have to sit back and look at and say, what do we do now? Well, this is a group of people that is actively coming after certain aspects of control and they're doing it with this thought process. Okay, stripped to its essentials, corporatism, and this is the key word is corporatism here, is principally, principally defined by the shift from a supportive to a directive role for the state in the economy. In the traditional corporatist model, there are three key actors, the state which dictates policy, the capital owning and controlling private sector, and labor union leadership the conduit through which state policy is transmitted to the rank and file constituency. Well, we had labor unions here. We have, have had that for years. They weren't as strong as they were in Britain. But what these people did, if you look into the next one, in a modified corporatist paradigm in which we first set forth in 95 and reiterate here, there is no role for labor. The conduit for state policy is instead the litigious public interest group which represents the rank and file constituency in much the same way as a labor union leadership does in the traditional model. The public interest group negotiates state policy and transmits it to the citizenry, bringing to the negotiating table the threat not of a labor strike, but of costly and time-consuming litigation. So through the threat of litigation with the entire background of governing the state, They've literally come up with, well, we'll give them what they want through the stakeholder consensus models, through the collaborative governance models. So they take and substitute this entire thing with a false or a perceived public input session into it because the stakeholders now qualify for what we should be doing. Okay, what we should be doing, these areas here, this room has housed the for the state water board. Um, they were doing a D, I think it was a DEQ for the uh, suction dredge mining aspect of things. They were doing all different things. The BLM office has all of the meetings for public input. Well, each time we look at this, if you break down the BLM, the state of Oregon, this is one of the biggest conflicts of interest that there was. The land management, as we know for the past couple of weeks, our land management is a total failure. We have to breathe air that is so foul, you know, it, it is sickening in, in every regard. I had to take my wife to an emergency room and it, it was like she could not breathe. She had an asthmatic or a bronchi bronchial reaction to this air. So you look at this and now this same state legislature that won't, that, that is pushing these massive amounts of nightmares on us all the time enacts laws that don't want to put fireplaces in new houses, that don't want us to burn wood stoves in the wintertime. And you look at these contradictions in, in common sense that just make no sense whatsoever. And I, I break it down and I look at all of this. This right here, be not intimidated nor suffer yourselves to be wheedled out of your liberties by any pretense of politeness, delicacy, or decency. These are, but, there, these are but three different names for hypocrisy, chicanery, and cowardice. Now you look at that, and this is what's happened. They have taken us, brought forth this nightmare, that, and rammed it down our throats, and have been pushing this at us in a way that is you know, so strong in our lives and so around us at every level. This past week, we uh, there's been what dam removed, Weimer Dam, and they started to remove Fielder Dam. There's a lot of background fighting going on over that. It still may not come to pass. It still may come to pass. There's a huge amount of things going on with it. But the biggest thing of it, it, it was stored water. Now, the governor herself had placed emphasis <clears throat> in an emergency drought. <coughs> Excuse me. In the emergency drought, um, announcement that she had made. And, and we gave her constitutional uh, changed powers in the last election where they had 
increase the power of a of an emergency declaration by the governor. Now, so the governor, in her mandate for that, called for restrictions for more stored water, or, or being monitoring it, taking care of it, making sure that we had an abundant supply of stored water. Well, now they're trying to breach another dam. Now you look at this, and I mean it's ludicrous when you sit down and look at it. You go back to what I was talking a little bit earlier, okay? We have situations arising where people, the girl that they put in jail, or they, that the judge was sentencing earlier, and I don't even know, did I finish that story? <laughs> okay. I was tied up with a microphone and I lost my place, I apologize. In the end result, the federal judge that sentenced this girl sentenced her to read two books. So she read the she read off the sentences, read the two books, and then she gave her the lightest sentence possible. While locally we had a guy who had a dam that he was originally permitted to have on his property, a guy named Gary Harrington, and they put him in solitary confinement. Now you think about that. Who committed the greater environmental nightmare? Okay, and now this guy was being punished for holding stored water that the fire crews were actually dipping out of during fire season. So we look at these things as a common sense factor and an idea and a basis of what they're doing, how they're going to it, and it drives a wedge into me that I just get really angry and I search further and I search deeper and I try to find their documents.